How do we live in the world, in this culture, as Christians? It was just a few months ago that little baby Charlie was 11 months old and in London, the parents wanted to bring that 11 month old to the United States to receive treatments. But the British court said that they would not be allowed to leave the country and come to the United States. The government is dictating the health and the life of that child. Then the parents decided that since there's no treatment available, that they wanted to bring their baby home in order to care for it as little Charlie died. But the government stepped in again and said, no, you cannot take your child home. The child has to go to hospice care. Now, what do we do as Christians? How do we respond to that living in this culture? We see the persecution of Christians intensifying all around the world. We see that with the Ascidi Christians in Syria, the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Uh, we see uh, in North Korea horrific things that are happening to those who are followers of Jesus Christ. It's been happening for centuries, but it's intensifying. And we see it even here in the United States, the persecution in some form or fashion that comes to those who are followers of Jesus Christ. We, we see the issue of freedom of speech. What does that mean anymore anyway? As a Christian, what does freedom of speech mean? Are we allowed to freely speak our faith? Are others allowed to speak freely what they believe without resorting to violence? What is freedom of speech? What about the monuments? How does a Christian engage the culture in that discussion about monuments, whether they should stay or go? What do you say? What's your response when you're asked? It's not just a matter of opinion, but, but as a Christian, how do we respond to that? What about a physician-assisted suicide just this past week? Dr. Tanya Dawes of Comics Valley, British Columbia, made a quote concerning their health care system. They have a program called Medical Aid in Dying Program. Medical Aid in Dying Program, where physicians are being paid by the government to perform physician assisted suicide. She said that she's considering no longer participating because it's not worth it financially she says it's financial suicide for me to do this to accept this Medicaid program they have in Canada to to assist people in killing themselves she didn't quit because it was wrong morally so what's the Christian response to that in our culture times are changing what about tolerance it seems it's one-sided isn't it It seems that we're to be tolerant of the culture, but the culture will not be tolerant of us. Is it fair game? And how do we respond to that when it's not? Transgenders in the the military. That's a hot topic. And so as Christians, how do we respond to that issue and live in this culture that seems to be changing? New Age humanism, which is prolific. I love this headline I saw this past week. Now listen carefully. You got you to listen. The headline. Arizona psychic hit by a car says he never saw it coming. <laughs> Don't you love it? I mean, that answers it right there. How do we live as Christians in our culture? I want you to go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel is the perfect book for us to go to in answering this question how we are to live in our culture we're going to learn today uh, then same is true today there are only two options of how you're going to live in the culture in 2017 it will be either compromise or courage you will compromise your faith or you will live courageously in the culture that we're in in 2017 and we're going to see that from the example of Daniel and his three friends all right so as we look at Daniel I want us to read Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 and then I want to give you just a real brief overview of the context Daniel 1 in the year the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah let's stop there for just a moment remember the children of Israel 
they leave Egypt. They go into the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, Moses dies. That generation dies off. Joshua is now to lead them into the promised land. Last Sunday we talked about how to move from the wilderness, shift our paradigm from the wilderness to, uh, to victory, uh, to living by faith. And so uh, we, we see them going in there. They, co- they conquer the land and they uh, establish themselves as the people of God. And then judges are established. They have basically what's called city-states. And locally there are judges. And then there became judges over the nation of Israel. They wanted a king, so they chose Saul as their king. Then there was David, then Solomon, his son. At the end of Solomon's reign, you have a divided kingdom. The northern kingdom of ten tribes, the southern kingdom of two tribes. This also called Judah. Now notice what it says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the Assyrians have already taken the northern kingdom into captivity. Now it's time for the southern kingdom to go into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. That's the temple. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace, and to teach them the Chaldean, that's Babylon, or Babylonian language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time they were to serve in the king's court. Among them from the descendants of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them different names. To Daniel, he gave him the name Belt to Shazar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now let's stop there. All right, so here's what you have. Chapter 1, you find that these young men, uh, the Bible uh, says they were young in age. And this was very common for a king to conquer a land and take young men like these and bring them into his court and to train them, to train the new culture, these who have been brought in to a a different culture. And historians tell us that these young men would have been teachable age, which means they were around 14 or 15 years of age, Daniel and his three friends and others that were brought in for this purpose. And so this is the test. They are to eat the king's food and drink his wine. Daniel says, we don't need to do that. Let us eat our food, vegetables, and drink water, and then test us and see the difference. And the Bible says that after that period of years that they were trained in that way, that they were ten times more fit than those men in Babylon who uh, ate from the king's court. And so there's their first test. In chapter 2, well, we find that uh, there is this uh, dream, this vision that takes place. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a statue. Now, to make a long story short, the statue represents the different nations or kingdoms that are going to follow the Babylonian kingdom. The last one, though, there are four, but the fifth one is different. There is a rock that falls off the statue, but it crushes the statue. That rock representing Jesus Christ and the establishment of a messianic kingdom that is going to last forever. Then you find in chapter 3 the story of the fiery furnace. The young men would not bow down to the statue, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the furnace, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was angry about it. And he heats up the furnace seven times hotter. As they are walking toward uh, the furnace to throw them into the fire, the men who are, are taking the young men there, they die so hot. And the three young men, they fall into the fiery furnace. And then we'll get to the rest of the story in a few moments. Then in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream of a tree. It's not a good dream. It's it's bad news for him. He literally is going to go crazy for a period of time. And then he'll be restored. Chapter 5, you have the handwriting over the wall. There's King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and then Darius. Those are the three kings during Daniel's tenure while he's in Babylon. And so there's the handwriting on the wall. Uh, 
A uh, very famous scene there with King Belshazzar. Then in chapter 6, you have Daniel in the lion's den. He does not uh, compromise. He prays to his God, and Darius has him thrown into the lion's den. And, of course, he is saved. Chapter 7 through 12, you have visions and prophecies. And several of these are related to the end times. Don't have time to get into all that, but it's a very fascinating study. But the, the primary purpose of the first six chapters is to show how these young men lived in a different culture and how we live in our culture today. Here's the thing. I want to teach us today, if you're uh, here for the first time, I'm going through a series called Paradigm Shift. And here, here's the, the shift is from compromise to courage. It's very easy for us to compromise in the culture that we live in rather than live with courage and so I want to show you today how to shift that paradigm in your life now listen this has significant implications for the church and how we do ministry and that's going to uh, be discussed next Sunday uh, how we do church in a culture that is changing how we reach our culture for Christ so I want everyone to be here because it really is going to set the tone for things down the road as we think about reaching our community for Christ all right, I want to say, uh, show us three things this morning. First of all, notice the change of culture. The change of culture happened for these young men, first of all, by change of location. Chapter 1, verse 2, they're carried to the land of Babylon. From Jerusalem to Babylon, from the holy city to a pagan city. It was a drastic change for them because the children of Israel, for the most part, became a pagan culture in the promised land. They compromised their faith. They adapted to the culture. They were not willing to live courageously in the culture when God told them not to do that. But there were young men, these young men, who did not compromise their faith. They lived with courage, and they're in a new land now. And so here they're forced to determine whether or not they're going to compromise or live with courage based on their location. A change of location created this change of culture. Notice verse 4 says they had to learn a new language and a new literature. Chapter 1, verse 2, though, I want you to notice. The Lord handed Jehoiakim to Nebuchadnezzar. This was all God's design. God had said that if you don't repent and don't change, you're going to be taken into captivity. But God had a purpose, not in order to punish Israel, but to bring these three men into the kingdom and Daniel into Babylon. God put them there. You see, when there's a change of location, the question that is often asked, the enemy will, will bring this to our mind, why am I here? Why did God bring me here? God put these men in Babylon, and listen, God has put you here. You may be wondering, why in the world did God bring me to Cape Girardeau, Missouri? Why has he taken me here? God has put you here. God has handed you to this place. I, 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 I'm not going to get into detail about the story, but I was a junior in high school going in, it was August, just two weeks before school started, and my dad got us all together, and he said, we're going to Clearwater, Florida. We lived in Texas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. At that time, the Mid-Cities area was still somewhat ruled. It was a bedroom community. It would explode, but uh, the, the, it was, it was uh, you know, a different lifestyle totally. Uh, in my high school class, when I was a sophomore, there were 750 in that class, and uh, many of them drove pickup trucks. You'd drive by the Trinity High School parking lot, and you'd see pickups everywhere. Nobody in Clearwater, Florida, even knew what a pickup looked like. I mean, it's the beach life. In 750 in that class, two guys on my football team had, had a pickup truck. Only two in the parking lot. It was a drastic culture. No dress code for girls in Clearwater, Florida tight dress code in Euless, Texas. Now, I was a 16-year-old boy. You talk about changing culture. And on and on and on I could go. The location drastically changed uh, the culture that I was living in. I, I was not familiar with that kind of culture. And so I had to ask, why am I here? What's the purpose of God putting me here? Notice also there was a change of identity. In two ways, their names are changed in verses 6 and 7. I want you to notice the difference. Daniel, in the Hebrew, his name means God is my judge. Baal to Shazar means Baal protect his life. Baal was one of the pagan gods of Babylon. 
Hananiah meant Yahweh is gracious. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means command of Aku. That was the moon god of, uh, of Babylon. Mishael, who is what God is. Who is what God is. No one compares to him. His name was changed to Meshach, to play on words. Who is what Aku is. Azariah, his name meant Yahweh has helped. His name was changed to Abednego, servant of Nebo, another Babylonian god. So the culture is changing their identity by the change of their names, also their family. They moved from a biological family to the king's family. They were used to their family, the way in which their family lived and how they loved each other and cared for each other, ministered to each other. Just the the daily living in, in their family. They're no longer in their family. Sometimes our family dynamics change, don't they? We live in a culture where the family is constantly changing. And how do we we live in that culture? The change of identity. Who am I? Uh, Also, there's a change of purpose. In 1 verse 4, it says, He was capable, these men are capable of serving in the king's palace. My identity makes me ask the question, who am I? Here, the purpose is, why am I here? What's the purpose for being here? And so these are questions that we ask ourselves. There's the change of culture. Where am I? Who am I? And why am I here? What's the purpose for God having me here? A change of culture can often create confusion about these issues in our lives. Now, I want you to notice there's evil in the culture. But there was good in that culture as well, and there's good in our culture if we're trying to see it. And listen, God uses the same strategy that the enemy will use to try to confuse us. But God responds to that strategy by this. Notice there has to be a change of location for us. Colossians 1 verse 13. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of he loves in whom there is forgiveness of sin. Redemption, forgiveness of sin. So there has to be a change of location for us in order for us to live in our current culture. That I need to be transferred from the enemy's kingdom, a kingdom of darkness, to a kingdom of light. Then where am I? I'm in the Lord's kingdom. I live in his home. That's residing in my heart. I, I, I live in this culture. I'm in the culture. But listen, I'm not of the culture. This is not my home. Notice, secondly, there's a change of identity for us. Colossians 1.22. He has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Now, what does that mean? It means God's given me a new name. He's given me a new life, the Bible says. I'm a new man. I'm a new creation. I have a new identity. I've been adopted into a heavenly family. I now have a heavenly father who's a perfect, loving father. That's that's who I am now. I am God's child. I'm not a child of this culture. I'm not just a child of a biological family, good or bad. I've been taken into, accepted, and adopted into a different family now, God's child. There's a change of purpose. They were chosen to serve the king. We have been chosen to serve our king, to glorify him, to proclaim him, to serve him, the Bible says. So we need to understand that although there's a change in location, a change in identity, a change of purpose when we are relocated or whatever happens, where you live, that God has also done that within us so that we can live courageously and not compromise in the culture that we're living in. So important. You need to remind yourself when you're confused by this culture, I live in his home. I am his child, and I must serve him. Now, I'm going to give you three takeaways this morning based on the three points. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because it's important. God is more interested in changing the culture within you than changing the culture before you. God is more interested in changing the culture within you than changing the culture before you. Yes, I'm to be salt and light in the culture. I live in this culture, and I'm to make a difference in the culture. 
But if God is not changing the culture within you, you're not going to be able to make any impact in the culture. There's not going to be any eternal value in what you're doing out in the culture apart from the change that is taking place within you. That's what's going to empower you to live courageously and not compromise your faith in Christ. The change within you. Notice secondly, notice the test of compromise. There are several tests they face that we're going to face. To refuse the royal diet could have been taken as an insult to the king and an act of disobedience. And that's the test before us. We're afraid to insult others if we live courageously. We, we are more concerned about what they're going to think about us rather than what God thinks of us. And really what it comes down to, we don't say it, but I, I'm more concerned about insulting man than insulting God. If I compromise and go along with the culture. Notice a second test. There was pressure from Daniel's peers that made the decision difficult. Everybody else is doing it, so I'll just go along and do it as well. Now, kids, adults have the same problem, same issue of peer pressure. I know you face that. Everybody else is doing that. You've said that to your parents. Listen, your parents said the same thing, but your parents are facing the same thing. They may not tell you that, but all of us feel that pressure. In ministry, it's very easy to feel pressure from others to compromise in order to have more people in church. You start, you start watering down the gospel so you can get a bigger crowd. That ain't going to happen. But that's the pressure. Everybody else is doing that. Maybe I should do that. That's the test. Daniel and his friends, what did they do? They separated themselves. They were different. Some would see them as strange. I'll come back to that in just a moment, all right? Another test. Their actions could have jeopardized their potential for advancement in the king's court. If I don't go along with this, I may not get the promotion. I may not get the, the raise. My boss is asking me to do something that is unethical. And if I don't do what he says, not only will I not get an advancement, I'll lose my job. I'm not going to have any friends if I don't go along with what they're doing. And what they're saying. I'm not going to get that position. Whatever else. Another test. A new location may have tempted them. To be unfaithful. Babylon was 900 miles away. From family and friends. They'll never know. They won't, they won't even know that I've done this. They won't even know I'm, I'm living this way now. They don't, people here don't know my family. They're not going to text them. And tell them what's going on. They don't even know them. Though others may not see, God is seeing. Like I said, when we come in here to worship, it, it, it's not that we're here to entertain ourselves. He's the audience. He's not just watching how we're worshiping. He knows our heart of worship. And when we're living in this culture, he sees our heart, he sees our attitude, he sees those actions, though nobody else might. It's a big temptation. Listen, someday we're going to give an account. The Bible makes that clear. Or, it would have been easy to become bitter because God took them into captivity. What did we do to deserve this? We were living a godly life back in Jerusalem. Yeah, nobody else was. But you see, that's the point. That became a victim because of other people's sins and now they find themselves in a different culture and they could have become very bitter I struggled with that when I moved that was a severe temptation on several levels but God pulled me out of that and it's very easy for us to become bitter in that same way because we're not protected like we thought God was going to protect us now see the issue is Relating to the culture versus compromising to the culture. We talk about relating to the culture. In business, you're trying to relate to the culture in order to sell the product or to do your business, whatever. As Christians, we, we want to relate to the culture, but how do we do that without compromise? Now, here's the takeaway. 
God is more interested that you are respected by the culture than in you relating to the culture. God is more interested that you are respected by the culture than relating to the culture. That means you've compromised in order to relate to the culture. Now, here's what I found out. Again, I struggled with this, particularly when I was younger, about feeling like that if I didn't go along, that I would not be respected. But you know, just the opposite is true. You see, there are those out there who don't like God. They hate God. They don't want anything to do with God. But they know you're a Christian. And if you go along and compromise, what's going to happen? They're not going to accept you into the group. They're not going to think more of you. They're going to think less of you. They'll be disrespectful of you. Rather than, I don't agree with the way he lives. I don't like the way he lives. But... He's got great courage to live that way. He's bold in his faith. He, you know he's a Christian. She's a Christian. So though we live in this culture, you'll find that there will be those who will be respectful of you. I say this very humbly, but this is the example. When, when I told my coach that I was moving, uh, he told me I was going to start and play that my junior year. I was thrilled, but then I went home and moved to Florida. Totally different ball game. His son was in my age, was my age, and we played together. And I went by to say goodbye to him and say goodbye to the coach. And, and he said, Mark, I just want to tell you, I respect you for the way you live. Now, I wasn't perfect, and I did stupid stuff. But I will never forget that sentence. I, I didn't think Rodney cared anything about me. We didn't really associate a whole lot. He was in the popular crowd. He was, he was in the popular crowd. It was a big crowd. But young people and others, I want to tell you, God's more interested in you being respected. Now, you may not feel like they're respecting you, but they're watching. And I promise you, it'll have a great impact in the culture you live in. Now, third... How do we move? How do we shift our paradigm from compromise? What are the steps we need to take to courage? All right? Well, the steps of courage are these that we'll see from the example of Daniel and his friends. There are four. Four steps. Number one, you have to begin with moral authority. These men, young men, teenagers, had moral authority. Now, everyone has moral authority. Everyone is making a decision based on your moral authority. What determines how you live? What are your values? Because what you value will determine what's the filter I use to make decisions, how I respond to the things that there are in life. For some, they would say, my moral authority is my family. This is the values we had as a family. I like these values, and these are the values I'm holding on to when I live my life. And I get married and raise my kids. These are the values because these were our family values. Or you may be associated with a particular group. And these are the values. This is the authority of the group, the moral authority of the group. And so uh, I, I value these. And so I want to live this kind of life because this is, I, I'm in this group. And this is valuable to me. Or it may be that uh, the culture is your value. That's your moral authority. And so this is what the culture is doing, and, you know, I, I want to be a part of the culture. I, I, I don't want to stick out. I don't want to, you know, I want to be a part of it. So the culture becomes your moral authority. But for most people, their moral authority is themselves. This is what I believe. This is what I think is right. Therefore, this is the way I'm going to live. And, and you may want to live that way. And that, that, that you have your moral authority, that's great. This is my moral authority. So let's all get along by respecting each other's moral authority. That doesn't work. That's why we have wars. That's why you have arguments. That's why even in your own family, when you are trying to share the values of that family, you're going to have problems because there is a deeper moral authority that you need to live in this culture what was the moral authority for Daniel and his friends? It was God's word. They were not going to disobey the command of God. 
And our moral authority has to be the Word of God. Because listen, if anything else is your moral authority, that means there is no moral authority. There's only moral chaos. Moral chaos if it's not the Word of God. And we go to the Word of God because, and listen, here's, here's, here's a sentence I hear. Well, that's what God said, but that's not what He meant. That, that's, what, that's what it says, but that's not what He means. This is what He means. Well, how do you know that's what He means? I mean, I mean where'd you get that? In other words, interpreted means, I am my own moral authority. I'll determine what is truth. And you see, we can't live that way in this culture and survive it. These men had a deep resolve concerning their moral authority. Notice chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel determined, he resolved that he would not defile himself. He would not defile himself. That's how we live. We've got to have moral authority. That's where it begins. Moral authority. Secondly... We need prayerful support. We need to seek God, and we need to seek godly friends. Chapter 2, verse 17, these two come together. Then Daniel went to his house and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about the matter, urging them to ask the God of heaven. What, what happened? Daniel sought his friends, and they sought God for prayerful support. And this is where the value of the church is so important. That we have that prayerful support. That we're connecting with people. God has not designed us to live in our culture as Christians alone. He's designed it that we live together in community. And we call that the church. There's the big church. Everybody who's a part of Christ. It's around the globe. And then there's the local church. The local representation of the body of Christ. Now, I said this the first hour, and I'm going to say it this hour. I may be sticking my neck out, but listen, if you don't have prayerful support, if you're not connected to a few people where you, you need that support and encouragement, then you call us, and we're going to get you connected. We have venues and avenues for you to get connected with people where you can uh, have that prayerful support. We need each other. We need that encouragement as as they had that. Third, this is really important. If, if, we're, if we're going to take a step where we're not compromising, we, there has to be personal engagement in the culture, but it has to be done the right way. Personal engagement. Now, what happened here? These men, first of all, faithfully served. They, they were in the king's court. They didn't run from the king's court. They were living in the king's court. They lived in a pagan culture, but they were faithful in the job that they had, and they performed it well. They gave their very best because it was a witness to Christ, to God in that context. For us, it is a witness unto Christ. As others are watching how we perform our jobs, how we live out our lives. Chapter 6, verse 3 gives an overview. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit. God blessed Daniel because he was faithful in the job that he had there. Secondly, we have to communicate effectively. Chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says Daniel responded with tact and discretion. He wasn't obnoxious as a Christian. He wasn't weird as a Christian. Now, I can say that because I am a Christian. There are some weird Christians out there. Now, the world will say that. Well, that means we're a fool for Christ. You know, we understand what Paul meant by that. They, they, don't, they, don't, you know, they don't understand the Christian culture. But in the Christian culture, there are some weird Christians who are sometimes ab, uh, uh, obnoxious. They're not relating to the culture. They, they, they are repulsive to the culture. You see, a person needs to be wise and winsome where they're seeing the love of Christ. And what is that? That's a magnet. That's an invitation. And that's how we need to be relating to the culture. We need to be communicating effectively into the culture where they may not understand it, but we're lovingly, winsomely communicating with them. Then, 
We need to demonstrate humility. It's not about us. I want you to notice chapter 2, verse 19. The mystery was then revealed to Daniel in a vision at night as he's interpreting the dream. And Daniel praised the God of heaven and declared, May the name of God be praised forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power. And now you have let me know what, you have, what we've asked of you, for you, have not, for you have let us know the king's mystery. Verse 27, Daniel answered the king, No wise man, medium, diviner, priest, or astrologer is able to make known to the king the mystery he asked about. Daniel is humble in the culture. He's different, but it's not about him. And so he's not pointing anybody to himself. But what does he do? The next step. He introduces God. Notice verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I'm not the one revealing this mystery. I'm not the one interpreting this dream. God is the one who's doing it. Now let let me help you here. The whole reason these young men were taken to Babylon was to introduce God to King Nebuchadnezzar and the whole king's court. The reason you're living in this culture in 2017 is for one reason, and that is to introduce God to the culture. That's why you've been put here. That's your purpose. You belong to God, and your job is to introduce God. You're bringing God to the culture. And helping them understand who he is. That's that's how we live courageously in the culture and not compromise. Because that's what it's about. Notice also, we're to speak truth as we personally engage the culture. Chapter 4, verse 27. Therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy. We, we, there are times we have to speak truth. It may not be a popular message. But you see, if we live it right, if we're building bridges in the culture, that we've earned the right to be able to help somebody understand what's going on in their life. And he says, here's what's going on in your life. You need to turn from your sin and turn to God. Also in the culture, we defend the helpless. Notice what he says in verse 27. That your job is to help the needy. You see, a powerful witness we have in this culture is when there are others who are discarding the weak and the helpless, those who have no voice. We stand up for those. We help those. And we're a voice for truth as we defend the helpless. Listen, God does not want us to run and hide from the culture. He wants us to personally engage in the culture. We're not living in fear of the culture. We're living by faith in the culture. Now the last step is that there needs to be confident assurance. You need confident assurance. You you, you have it if you possess Christ in your life. First of all, what is the confident assurance you need? God can be trusted. Chapter 3, verse 17. This is my favorite Two verses in all of Daniel. Because he says, now if you don't, if when you hear the music, if you don't bow down before the statue, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. They've already been guilted out. So they say, you don't even need to play the music. Don't worry about it. Here's their response. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But here it is. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the statue you set up. We may die. He may not rescue us here, but he'll rescue us there. We're not going to compromise. We're going to serve God. You can have confident assurance 
that you can trust God. I'm going to trust God now in this circumstance. I'm going to trust God in this culture as crazy as it is, as bad as it is. But I'm going to trust Him. Notice also, you can be, have assurance that God is with you. Chapter 3, verse 25, they're thrown into the fire. He exclaimed, the king, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. How many were thrown in? Three. In case you need help with math. Three. But how many are in the fiery furnace? Four. Many believe Jesus Christ himself appeared on the scene. There are these moments in Old Testament where many believe Christ revealed himself. The pre-incarnate Christ revealed himself, this being one of them. It could have been an angel. We don't know. It could have been Christ himself. The point is, God showed up. He was there. And you can have confident assurance while you're living in this culture so that you don't compromise. You can live courageously knowing that as bad as this is right now, what I'm dealing with, God is with me. And the third assurance is that God will bless you. Notice chapter 3, verse 28, and what happens. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb, and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now here's the point. The takeaway is this. God is more interested in you living courageously in the culture than in hiding in fear from the culture. We're not supposed to remove ourselves from the culture. And hide in fear of the culture. I'm afraid how the culture is going to influence me. No. We are light. And light dispels the darkness. And we have God with us. Not to live in fear of the culture. But to live courageously. With assurance that we can trust in him. Now, how do we shift our paradigm from compromise to courage? I want to close with what Paul Tripp said. It is only when you look at this dark world through the lens of the existence, power, authority, wisdom, faithfulness, love, and grace of the King of kings and Lord of lords that you see reality with clarity. You cannot ever assess and understand what you were facing if you omit the fact of facts the existence of God. In fact, that's how the writer of Hebrews defines faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God wants to bless your life while you live in this culture. And the blessing doesn't come from compromise. It comes from courage. Living courageously in the culture would you bow your head and close your eyes there might be somebody here this morning who would say pastor I've asked these questions who am I where am I why am I here and now I'm beginning to understand that God loves me and God wants a relationship God has a purpose for my life and he does he loves you and he wants you to experience his grace and his power in your life. And it's not just believing that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and that he was raised from the dead three days later. But it's an act on your part of turning from your sin and turning to Christ. The Spirit of God will empower you to do that as you, as you make that turn. And you may not know exactly what to say or do in order to experience God coming into your life, but we'll help you do that. In just a moment, Jeff and I will be here at the front, and you just come to one of us, and we'll help you understand what you need to do in order to have the change of culture within your heart. That's where it matters most.
There might be some in this room, many in this room, who would say, Pastor, I know the Lord, but boy, I'm being tested in this culture. Well, the Lord knows that. He's not surprised. He knows what, the exact temptation, the test that you're facing. And God wants to help you. You're worried about it. You're anxious about it. You don't know what to do, how to respond. I want you to ask the Lord in these quiet moments. Confess to him this is where, what's going on. And ask him to help you. Ask him to give you the wisdom. As these young men gained wisdom, God will give you that wisdom. He'll give you the strength that you need to do the right thing. So that you can live courageously. Not compromise. There might be others that, listen, you need support. You feel like you're all alone. And God wants you to be part of a Christian community called the church. It's his church. And we're just a local representation of his church. And we would love for you to be a part of the family here at Linwood. And so maybe in just a moment when we begin to sing, you just come and, and we'll help you as you want to identify and be a part of the family here. Where you belong to a community of, of, of faith and where you can gain that support. Some of you may just need to come and pray or maybe talk with somebody. You need to share your heart with someone about what's going on in your life, and they can pray for you. Lord, thank you for speaking to my own heart. Thank you for revealing yourself in a very powerful way about the culture and how we live in this culture that would honor and glorify you. It's so easy to compromise, Lord. It's so hard to live with courage. But you've enabled us to do that through the power of Christ. Father, help these who need to make commitments now. Give them the courage to take the step of faith they need to take right now. In Jesus' name, amen.